update the details of two o'clock today. Um, and um, a few housekeeping things before we go. We're not expecting a fire alarm today, so if there is a fire, we'll get up and head out through these doors to the leading point, which is just behind geography. Um, the toilets are on the bottom of the door, there's a water tap and you can use to refresh yourself. And um, we'll be breaking um, at 11.45, we'll have time for some questions. And um, moving on throughout the session. So without further ado, I'd like to leave the floor to David Gilkner. He's um, visiting all the way from Colorado, USA, Boulder, and um, he's going to tell us about an scientist applying the role of career in industry. So great. Over to you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming. I uh, appreciate you. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. I'm honored it's our first industry day. This is great. And uh, I'm also very pleased to be here at the University of Southampton. Uh, early in my career, I had a lot of work with uh, the fiber laser, fiber amplifiers, and a lot of the technology that's done here. So I even worked with an alum from Southampton about uh, 20 years ago, and so it's great to finally get here and, and see the university. It's great to be here. Before I get started, I like to pull my audience and find out who I'm talking to. Uh, so how many of you uh, are scientists or are getting a degree in science versus engineering? Okay. Versus, versus engineering. Yeah, versus engineering, right. <laughs> Only because, I mean, I know here, so this is a unique environment where they're actually combined, I get that, but it's still, I'm, I'm kind of curious since, you know, scientists is in the title. How many would you consider yourself scientists? And what are the disciplines then? Physics, probably? Chemistry, anybody, anybody else? Is it mostly physics? Okay. And then the engineers, who would consider themselves engineers? Good. So I realize you work together quite a bit. I guess a lot of this is electronic, uh, double E, electrical engineers, probably. Okay, great. Uh, how many postgraduates? All right. Big part of the graduate. And, and then undergraduates? Anybody undergraduates? Okay, so it's really uh, postgraduate students, yeah, primarily. So how many of you are planning to go into industry when you get out of school, when you get out of university? <laughs> okay, and how about academic career? Next there too. Well, good. So you can see from the title, can a scientist find a rewarding career in industry? So I'm primarily talking here about uh, how to find a job in industry and about you know issues around that and the challenge of moving out of an academic environment uh, into an industrial career. Um, I think it applies to engineers as well. I talked to a lot of engineers. Frankly, you know some of the differences. We talked a little bit about it, but in the end. You're all working in technology, you're all in an academic environment, you're all interested in getting a job. And for those of you who want to move into industry, I think you'll find this really valuable. But even those of you planning a career in academia, I think will pull some things out of this. Uh, for one, if you end up as a, as a professor, I think it's great for you to understand, you know, the more you understand about what it's like to get out and try and find a job in industry from a uh, university, the more you can help your students, because I think that's a really important aspect of that. Most professors spend their entire career in academia and don't really understand what the industrial world is like. So I think this will be helpful for all of you. But I'm curious, for those of you that want to work in industry, what are some of the reasons you chose that career? Why do you want to do that? Anything in particular? Money? <laughs> Money's a good one. Okay. So it's like that here, just as, it in the, as it is in the U.S., you make more in industry. That doesn't surprise me. Um, I know, so a lot of the people I've talked to uh, and myself included, you know, basic research, fundamental research is very important, but it tends to be very long term. You spend a lot of time not really knowing who's going to use your, your work, whereas in industry it's very directly applied and you know who needs what you're doing. Uh, sometimes you know, the time frames are very different. They may, they may be looking for something in uh, six months to a year, but you know exactly who needs your work and, and why you're doing it. And so you know, those are some of the good reasons, some of the reasons you might do that. Uh, you want to see the results of your work faster than an industry. Sometimes you like a little bit more dynamic career than uh, the pretty well laid out track to a tenure track position. Um, and those are some of the reasons. But the challenge, the problem, the issue is starting a career in industry coming out of university can be, can seem really daunting uh, for a number of reasons. I think this is particularly true for a scientist. That may not really apply here because I know Southampton, and especially in the ORC, I know you guys do a great job of really having a very practical uh, and industry-focused approach. So I think you, you probably have a better feel for what it's like in industry than a lot of places I've visited, and certainly my own experience. But 
I think a lot of what I can say is still going to help you out. So I'll start by telling you a story here about that challenge. I'll tell you a story about the guy on the right-hand side there. Uh, that was me 20 years ago, um, and when I was a, a postgraduate student. So you see here already I, I noticed the, the language difference. It says College of Natural Sciences. We use that word differently. Um, but this was me in, in, post, in graduate school or as a postgraduate student. Language is a little bit different. We, we use college actually in university. It's, it's like you would use the term faculty here. So there's a College of Natural Sciences. Uh, there might be a College of Medicine. There might be a College of Arts and Music. And all those are grouped together in the university. So anyway. Um, but for, so I, I intended to be a professor my entire career in graduate school until about the last year. And uh, it just seemed like the natural path, especially being in physics. That was my degree. I got a bachelor's in physics and I got a PhD in physics. And I just figured I would be a professor because it seemed the natural pathway. In about my, my last year, really, I decided I wanted to consider industry. Partly, my friend uh, and lab mate, Roger here had been talking about industry all along, and by then I was thinking, yeah, maybe that sounds good. Plus, I had seen the academic environment for about six years uh, in graduate school and had decided, yeah, I don't think that's the career for me. I wanted something that was more dynamic. You know, I, the idea of, well, the security of a tenure track position sounded interesting. I wanted something more dynamic where I could try different things and, and uh, not just you know, head down one path. So I decided I I wanted to go into industry instead of the academic path, but it was all of a sudden I was faced with all of these challenges. One of the first big challenges was around design. I thought, okay, if I'm going to be going out into a, a career in industry, that's largely about product development, and product development is really about designing things, right? And certainly as a physicist, I didn't know how to design anything. How was I going to function in that world. If you think of something like a laser, it might be a, a product. And in fact, this is what I was aiming at, looking for a laser company. Well, there's mechanical design to design the box and the, the mounts. And yeah, I spent time in the machine shop. I made a lot of parts from my own experiment, but not, I, I was a hack, really. I, you know, nobody was going to hire me for my mechanical design skills. You have to get a real mechanical engineer for that. And of course, there's circuitry in there, and I could do a simple op-amp design. I could wire up some of the things I needed for my project, but nobody was going to hire me to design electrical circuits. And the same with software and, and optical design. All of these really require hard design skills to do them right. What was I going to do? How was I going to move into that? That was one of the big challenges I felt I faced. Uh, second is my advisor was a true academic. She had no clue what industry was like. And I remember the conversation where she specifically said, if you want to get a postdoc, I've got contacts, I can help you. That's, you know, if you want to head down that academic career. But if you want to go into industry, you're on your own because I don't know anything about it. I don't know anyone there. And I thought, oh, great. <laughs> well, so I have to find this path on my own. And the third challenge was kind of in what she said, but not directly. And that was that she expressed this idea that is pretty common in academia. Again, I don't think you probably see too much of that here in Southampton, but it's certainly true in the sciences, is that you're really intended to go into academia, despite the fact that there aren't enough jobs, and there's no way everybody who graduates with a PhD in physics alone could get a professorship. It's just not going to happen, but it still was talked about like somehow that was plan B, almost as though if the attitude was, well, those poor students who can't make it as a scientist, they'll go off and they'll play with nuts and bolts in industry, you know, and they'll make things like that, and that bothered me because it just seemed like, is it really a, you know, a second choice? Well, absolutely it's not, but uh, that's where I was sitting at the time. And so the big question that I was, that I faced, and this is the heart of this whole, you know, the why I give these talks, is I ended up thinking, how's a science nerd like me going to make it in the real world? You know, if I want to, if I decide I want to work in industry, how on earth am I going to do that? Because the roadmap to get there in terms of you know what skills I might need, in terms of who I talk to, in terms of is it really even a good choice, it was all not very clear to me at all. So uh, you know, what am I going to do? I'm a science nerd, or maybe the right word to be geek. Do you uh, differentiate between the two words here? I don't know. When I was when I was in graduate school, 
we actually would occasionally debate that. And I know you're thinking, you know, well, if you spend time debating whether you're a geek or a nerd, you're most certainly one or the other. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we used to discuss, jokingly, of course, but are we as physicists, are we geeks, or are we nerds? I think we're geeks. And the, the mathematicians in the next wing over, they must be nerds. Well, fortunately, this has all been worked out now. And, uh, <laughs> You know, on the internet, of course, you can find anything. We didn't have this at the time. We just had to sit and think about it over a beer. But the great thing, there's two great things about this, this diagram. The first, of course, is that what better way to express this than a Venn diagram, you know? <laughs> That's a perfect, very geeky way to do it. But the second great thing is that you can see a geek here is a combination of intelligence, and physicists like to say we're intelligent, and obsession. Yeah, okay, guilty as charged. I guess we have to admit that. So we were the geeks. But obviously, when you mix in the social ineptitude, you get the nerds. So, in fact, we were right. The mathematicians were, in fact, the nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Worked out really well. So I was pleased to find that diagram. So despite all my concerns, I managed to get a job. Uh, this is my, my first ID card, looking like I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Uh, but <laughs> working for a, for a laser company uh, called SDL that made... That the group I was in was trying to make tunable diode lasers for scientific applications. And how I did that is actually a whole separate story. Um, how I was able to sell myself and get that is a whole separate topic. But I did start that. And after about 20 years now in product development in a, a wide variety of jobs, uh, including, uh, so I spent some time in datacom transceivers with a company called PicoLite that was acquired by JDS Interface. Uh, time doing instruments at SDL, and in fact, this evolved into working with a lot of telecom <coughs> equipment and a lot of technology that has been developed here, in fact, erbium dome fiber amplifiers, uh, cladding pump fiber lasers, very exciting stuff. Uh, I spent some time, I moved from, so I was in California at the time, I moved to Colorado where I live now, I worked at Paul Aerospace for a while, doing uh, laser communications for satellites, or at least developing technology that will hopefully someday fly, that way. And now I'm at a company called Zola Technologies where we shine lasers through big industrial furnaces, things like coal boilers or steel furnaces or big chemical furnaces. Wide variety of, of projects, wide variety of uh, things that I've done. And through all this, I've learned that, first of all, making things people need, working in the industry, it's exciting, it's dynamic, and it's very rewarding. It's absolutely not the plan B that I had been led to believe in graduate school. That was one of the big lessons. But even more importantly, um, the skills, knowledge, and attributes of a scientist, even without the design skills, are definitely useful in industry. That was huge for me. I have a very different perspective on it now, and that's part of why I go out and, and give these talks, because I think the view that I have now is so vastly different than what I had in that last year uh, as a postgraduate student. So, and that's actually what led me to do this whole project uh, about six years ago. So I did this book. I actually, I went out a period between jobs, and I interviewed a lot of other scientists who had ended up in, in uh, industry and had made successful careers in industry because, so I was, I was looking for a job again. I was transitioning, and it reminded me of that whole struggle of how do you sell yourself? You know, how do you position yourself when you're a, a particularly a scientist? in a design kind of applied world. And of course, I was far better at the, at the time, but it, it got me engaged in that, and I interviewed a lot of other people, and I started going around and giving talks like this. So I've been doing this for several years, really to kind of you know, bring stories of successful scientists in industry to uh, students and, and early career scientists, kind of indicate that you, know, you may not have a really good vision as to what's out there, but it's a very rewarding career opportunity. Um, you know, some of the quotes, I learned an awful lot from this book, actually. You know, I, I, I did it to help other people, but I was amazed how much I learned myself from talking to these other people uh, and learning about their experiences. Things about why they got into industry in the first place. So Jack Jewell, he is one of the, uh, uh, he's really developed Vixels, vertical cavity semiconductor lasers for a lot of applications. People like uh, turn them into datacom transceivers. And he said, I want to create things that make a difference in others' lives. That's a big part of what drove him to move into industry. Tom Bauer, I needed more of a connection between risk and reward. That was lacking for me in pure research. 
Tom also founded a company called Meadow Rock Optics. They make polarization control optics. He didn't want a safe path. He wanted something where, yeah, I'm taking a risk starting a company, but you know what? That has the opportunity for a lot more reward if it's successful. And now 30 some odd years down the road, his company's still operating. He's creating jobs for about 100 people. And uh, he's very excited by that. Uh, Stuart McCormick. So Stuart is actually a Southampton grad. And I worked with him in California a number of years ago. Uh, he worked for Rob Easton here. And uh, he was also a physicist. He says the most rewarding part of the is the continued variety of things I get to work on. So unlike maybe the design skills, you know, I, I was, at the time, I was thinking, gee, do I need design skills? Should I, should I have learned to design something so I could go into industry? But the flip side of that is by having the more, the broader, general, non-design skills actually ends up leading to a variety of different things you could do, like the variety I showed and what I've done in the last 20 years. Uh, Stuart here is describing the same thing. He's actually a mergers and acquisitions program manager, or he was at the time I interviewed him anyway. He was out talking to companies that JDSU might want to acquire. And so he'd go out and he'd talk to the people and work in the due diligence, and boy, that's a job I never even thought of when I was in graduate school. I didn't even realize that existed. So there's a lot of variety out there. But out of all the things that I learned and all the things that are in the book, we have a limited time today, so I want to talk to you about three different things. One, what are some of the industry jobs that would be available to, and I say a scientist, and again, I'm thinking more somebody with a broader technical background and not specific design skills. That's probably the right way to think about it. I imagine that would probably cover a lot of you because I think you work with technology, you understand <coughs> a lot of different things. I'm not sure how many would say, yeah, I can you know, design circuits to the level of, uh, you know, hardcore WE or uh, like a mechanical engineer might design hardware. So I think it probably applies to a lot of people here. So what are some of the jobs that might work well for that broad technical background? What are some of the skills, knowledge, and attributes that make a, a scientist successful in industry? And how do you need to think differently about working in an industrial environment? Because it is very different than an academic environment. Briefly stated, science is about gaining more knowledge, industry is about profits. It's about money. And it really is very different. It's, it's useful to think differently. So does that sound like a good subset of things to talk about in the next, what do you have, about 20 minutes or something like that, 25? So let's head into that. So let's start off talking about some roles. What are some roles that might be good for a scientist or a broad technical background? System engineer. This is a job I didn't realize even existed when I was in graduate school. So what, is it, what does a system engineer do? What might that role be? Well, let's go back to the example of the laser. We talked about needing design engineers to do all the detailed design for each one of these. You need somebody, especially if, say, it's a fast laser or some tight specifications. You need really good circuit design, really good optical design. But somebody has to make sure all these things come together and work as a system and work as a device. Somebody has to talk to the customer and say, what are the requirements for this thing that might include things like how big it is and how much current it draws from the wall and how much out power, uh, output power it, it, it puts out and you know, if it's a tunable laser, what are the requirements for that? Somebody has to take all those requirements and break them down into the requirements for the different elements, the electronics and the optics and the mechanics. Because a lot of times the people that do the specific design here don't really understand the application. So if you understand the application because maybe you've used these tools, that makes you a great candidate for something like a system engineer. And maybe if you understand something about all these disciplines, you spent some time in the machine shop and you wired up some simple circuits. I know in my position, I thought system engineer was a great role. I couldn't design those perhaps, but I could definitely talk to the people that were doing that design and help them work together and come up with a combined product. In fact, sometimes I ended up interpreting because the optical engineer was using jargon that the mechanical engineer didn't understand, trying to tell him why he needed a specific mount, and the mechanical engineer is trying to describe why he can't do it. And to be able to interpret is part of helping that team work together. So that's a system engineer role. That's a great, uh, that's a great uh, opportunity. The next is project manager. So project manager may sound like it's all about schedule and budget. Uh, pretty much everything runs as a project in industry. And you may think, well, I have a research project. And that may be true. Um, you know, have you ever led a project? Well, you probably have. Was it well-defined? 
good advice if you're interested in leading a project in industry is to start think start thinking in your project in terms of schedule, budget, specific deliverables. That's a term that gets used a lot. You know, steps along the way, something that that is is finished and ready to be handed to a customer. It could be an internal customer, it could be an external customer. Uh, milestones, resources that you might need, because unlike a lot of uh, projects you might do as a postgraduate student, you really do very little all on your own in industry. You work with other people, and so an understanding of what other resources you might need is important. Thinking about the risks ahead of time. Whoops, jumped ahead here, pushed the wrong button. Uh, what are the risks? So if you say the schedule, in industry it's very common for someone to say, how long will it take you to do that? And you have to guess, not really knowing what's along the way. Things may come up, so that's the next step. Okay, what are the risks to meeting that schedule? Uh, and what are you going to do about mitigating those risks so they don't end up being a problem? This is the way people think in industry. And if you want to prepare yourself for a job, maybe leading a project, if you start thinking about your own project now while you're still... Uh, in university, that can be a big step and set you up for that kind of a role. Reliability engineer. This is another role I didn't even know existed when I was in university. But so, as an example, imagine parts for telecommunication systems. These have to be extreme, extremely reliable. They have to last for 15 or more years. They have to go through very stringent Telcordia tests. So. You will typically have at least one person, maybe a team, uh, that are focused on reliability engineering. They have to plan a lot of testing, collect and analyze a lot of data. If something goes wrong, they have to dig into it and figure out why did it fail. This is excellent for, this is like science work. Um, it's not design work, it's very different. And that's a great opportunity for somebody that understands how to set up an experiment and really understands um, science and data analysis. Uh, process development engineer. This is another role I didn't even know existed. But as an example, um, so it's one thing to design the product. It's another to say, how are we actually going to put it together? And a good example is medical equipment. Um, there's a guy named Roger McGowan who works for Boston Scientific. They make medical devices using gear. He uh, is a process development engineer. And one of the things he works on is uh, heart stent delivery systems. So the tube, the catheter that is used to deliver the stent, so that's something you put into an artery in the heart to keep it open and, and prevent a heart attack. Um, all those things have to be very well assembled, manufactured by, with, with very good processes so they meet very stringent requirements. So the developments of you know, how would you actually weld this together, he works on laser welding for some of these parts. Based on the materials you're using, what's the right process? There's a lot of testing that has to be done. Again, a lot of data analysis, not so different than the reliability engineer, but it's a very different process. Um, so process development engineer is another key job that fits a great broader uh, skill set than just specific design skills. And a technical lead. So you can lead a technical team. It's a little bit like the system engineer, where if you are leading a project, you might actually, you might not just manage the, uh, the system engineering aspect of it, but you might actually have a number of engineers that report to you, and even technicians that are responsible for putting a product together. Uh, because if you have that broader technical view, that vision for what the product needs to do, that sets you up to be a, a, a good technical lead. I started out developing the lasers uh, in the lab for those systems that I showed in that first picture. Uh, but within a couple of years, I had people reporting to me and actually helping direct what they would do, uh, hiring and, and uh, managing that team. So that is another role. All of these are great opportunities for somebody that's not, that, that doesn't have specific design skills, whether it's a, a scientist or a you know, broader technical set like you might have coming out of, out of Southampton here. Um, this is a quote from Roger, who worked at, uh, works at Boston Scientific. Scientists make great technical leads and project managers because of their critical analysis and problem-solving skills. Oh, I thought that was a great quote. So here's another job, uh, entrepreneur. Turns out five of the scientists in this book actually started their own companies and became successful entrepreneurs. Um, so that's another opportunity. If you've ever had any interest in doing that, it's very different than science research, but it actually is a, is a pretty good opportunity. Peter Fisk, 
another one of the people I interviewed for the book. So he founded a company called Wrapped Industries and is now CEO of Pax Water Technologies. But he started uh, with a PhD in geological and environmental sciences from Berkeley. Uh, he says, one of the greatest things about a science education is that you're constantly learning to solve problems you've never even seen before. It's not a design function, it's more of a research function, something you learn in research. I bet a lot of you learn that kind of a thing here. You learn to tackle problems you've never seen before. And he says, that's a great skill to develop for an entrepreneur for starting a company. <clears throat> so those are some of the jobs. There are certainly others, but some of the ones I wanted to cover in this talk. Let's move on to the next item. Skills, knowledge, and attributes. So I, I like those three terms because they express different things. And just to briefly go through them, skills are tools, things that you can develop, right, that you might use in your job. Knowledge, those are facts and figures and things that you learn. You might learn them from a book. You might learn them from work experience. Um, but they're not really something they're practiced. They're just facts. Attributes, that's a whole different thing altogether. Attributes tend to be things about a person like uh, what motivates you? How do you handle conflict? What kind of communicator are you? The big difference is skills and knowledge are things that can be developed. Attributes tend to stick with a person. They really don't change. They're about who you are. It might be the attributes that you have that determine why you chose the, the education path you did. It might also be part of what determines what career path you want to follow. Um, but my contention is that Scientists and engineers really both have certain attributes that I think set them apart. And it's good to understand some of those and how you might be able to leverage them into your career. So let's start off talking about some skills. Hands-on technical skills are great in a company. Any product that you're gonna, if you're in a company that makes a product, it has to be assembled. Somebody has to be putting that together. Now, technicians usually fairly low-level trained people will do the assembly, but somebody has to put together the first one, and usually that's somebody that really understands the full product, kind of that system engineer role. So having hands-on technical skills, that's definitely something you want to focus on, right? Now, put something together. It doesn't mean you'll be assembling things. It just means you might be the person to put together the very first one and get it to, focus, uh, get it to, to operate and get it to function properly. But then you can train somebody else to do it, or you can refine it into something that's manufacturable. Data analysis. I've been surprised how little good data analysis skills there are uh, in industry, even among technical people. So, um, but if part of what you've done, whether you're a scientist or engineer, is a lot of good data analysis, that's actually really useful. The ability to draw good conclusions from data, rather than take what's a rather human approach to think you see a pattern in something and jump to a conclusion, which can lead you in a total wrong direction and waste a lot of time and money, those good data analysis skills are really important. So it's a great thing to be able to focus on if you feel you have it. The broad technical knowledge base. So I've talked about that a number of times already. Uh, depends on what you studied, but I'll guess a lot of you working in the labs that I toured yesterday get a fairly broad knowledge, you know, understanding not just uh, you know, electricity or not just optics, not just mechanics, but, but fairly broad something you can leverage because if it's a system engineer role or the technical manager role, you can talk in a lot of these different languages, even if you don't have very detailed design skills. Um, that's a great thing to emphasize. So now we're starting to move to more attributes. So a scientific approach to problem solving, that is something that's trained, I think, but I also think now you're talking about something that comes naturally to some people. Problems are everywhere in industry. And it's not the mathematical problems or the physics problems or something you might solve when you're in university. They're real world problems. You have a plan, you plan to develop something, you have a schedule, you need to get there in nine months, and it needs to cost this much, and along the way you run into something that stops you dead in your tracks, and you have to figure out how to get around that. Um, even if it's not science, a methodical approach to getting through that problem, coming up with a good solution and implementing it can be very important. That's also a skill that is lacking in industry, and you can bring that if you think you have it. Uh, scientists are often prone to challenging assumptions. That's definitely an attribute, right? That's something about who somebody is. I don't think you learn to do that as much as you're just naturally that way, and that can be great too. You have to know when to quit and just move forward and get to a product, right? Industry is all about getting something to the finish line. You can't take too long analyzing it. 
But when something goes wrong, it's really important to be able to back up and challenge your assumptions. I've seen a lot of time wasted uh, in the jobs I've been in by <clears throat> just moving forward with assumptions and not really backing up and saying, hang on a second, what are we assuming that may not actually be true? Scientists tend to be very good at that, naturally. And the unexplained is not scary, but interesting. This, this actually came from a woman in the book I interviewed. She's actually a reliability engineer. And she deals with that a lot because her job is figuring out why something isn't lasting, as, why a product's not lasting as long as it's supposed to, and why they put it through some tests and it fails. And this is very disappointing to many people, right? Ah, failed the test. We were ready to introduce it to the market in two months, and now it failed the life test. What are we going to do? So she looked at it like, hey, this is something unexplained. This is what science was all about. And when I started my degree in physics, this is what I found interesting. So, you know, I'm not scared by that. I actually want to jump in and do it. That's, that's the attributes that made her a scientist in the first place. And she's found a great place to apply that in industry. Because now she wakes up in the morning, she thinks, hey, there's a problem at work. I can go try and find the answer to this. And is excited about it rather than, ah, this is terrible. Things aren't going the way we expected. So, yeah, what I'm talking about, that's actually getting at the attributes of what made her choose a, uh, a pathway down in science, and now she's finding great application in industry. Okay, the third thing that we talked about, how do you have to think and act differently? So the academic world and industry are very different. I mean, the way we, we sort of train people uh, to go into both of these fields, but in many ways they're very different, even if the technical training is similar. Um, there's, I have a whole different presentation on that too, where I go into more detail about the difference between the two worlds, but the one key thing that's different about them is if you focus on academia really is about increasing knowledge, and industry is really about increasing profits. At its heart, any company, regardless of the motivations of the people that go to work there, it has to make money. Somewhere there are investors, uh, board of directors, an owner, somebody that invested money into it and needs to see that money come back out of it. There are customers that are paying for a product and they need to get what they paid for. So it all comes down to money and that really drives uh, the attitudes and your focus in industry. Now, I don't know how that sounds when I say that. It may sound like, ah, oh, crap, it's all about money. But that actually makes it very pragmatic. And there can be, a, if, if you like that, uh, you don't waste a lot of time working on things that don't go anywhere, right? You and I were talking before the, the presentation about, you know, in industry, you've noticed that people are far more, you know, make a decision quickly and move on. That is absolutely true. If you like to spend a long time look, working on a problem, maybe an academic environment is better. But if you like that pragmatic approach of, look, we've got to get moving because we have a place to go, let's not waste time, make a decision and work to make that the right decision. That's what industry is about, and that's what changes a lot of these things. So in short, product development is not science research. The tools may be similar, the science that you use may be similar, but it is a very different approach. It's very practical. The time pressures are very different. In academia, you could work on a project for several years. So it sounds like here you tend to keep your postgraduate career or PhD to about four years, which is impressive. Uh, in the U.S., it, you know, I was there for seven years. It's a very different attitude in some cases. It was more of a, hey, you're here because you want to learn physics. You're not in any big hurry to get out there because you're just going to go on to a postdoc and then another postdoc and then an associate professorship. <laughs> so just go play in the lab for several years, and at some point you'll graduate. <laughs> well, in that, in, uh, you know, and that, at least in my mind, that's a lot of the academic environment. Again, I think you guys see more... Uh, uh, real world focused here, which is, I think is great. I think it sets you up for a, a career in industry far better than a lot of uh, universities I've, I've experienced. But in industry, time pressure can be far faster. It is not at all uncommon to need something in six months, nine months, or a year. And uh, so you have to move very quickly. Um, and that's a big difference. And you know, it may be easy to absorb and say, okay, yeah, I get it, it's faster. But you have to get that into your day-to-day -day activities and the decisions you make, you know, into not deliberating too long, into figuring out if you don't know something, you don't have the time to learn it, you need to go find somebody that knows so you can uh, move faster. Um, 
What's more, solving a, world, a real world problem has constraints far beyond just the technology. There are many other things that might matter. Can you put the product together for the right cost, despite the technology? Um, can you find a market for it? Uh, are there certain qualifications or tests or certifications, either in telecom or in medical or other devices, where there are regulatory bodies that determine how the thing must behave and what it has to pass? There's a lot of things beyond just that. Um, so it's unlike a science experiment where you just have to put the thing together and get the data and write your paper. A lot of other things are in it besides just the technology. Now that can actually be exciting. And a lot of the people I spoke to found solving those problems or found working in those environments and learning about them to actually be <coughs> an exciting part of the job. And, uh, you know, they had learned a lot of physics maybe and, hey, now I get to learn about business or even now I get to learn about uh, uh, medical regulatory testing. In industry, you need to rely on others. So as a generalization in an academic environment, uh, it's really all about kind of becoming the expert. You know, if you think of a uh, professor that stands out in a certain field, they basically did that by learning more about that topic than anybody else. And they may have a group of postdocs and postgraduate students who work with them on it, but they get there by being the expert. In industry, it's about getting someplace quickly, and it's not about, you know, if you're on my team and you work for me, I don't really care if you know the answer to the problem as much as if you can go find the answer to the problem. And I don't really want to pay you to learn it. I mean, yes, I want you to learn as you go along, but it's better to know who has the right information or who has the solution to your problem. Work with others, get it together as a team, and get to the solution quickly. So it's really about working with others. Uh, another quote from the book, Ashok Balakrishnan, he's a uh, founder and uh, co-founder and director of product development at Enablements up in Ottawa. I say up in Ottawa, but I guess it's over in Ottawa from here. I'm used to speaking from the U.S. Uh, I think strong social skills are one of the most important aspects of success in business. So it really is all about working with other people. Uh, you can't make it as uh, you know a lone expert. It's not the game at all. It's about working with other people. And again, a lot of people find that exciting. I like that part of it. Whether it's working with customers or whether it's working with a wide range of people within the company. It might be a finance person. It might be a salesperson. It might be uh, um, you know, people in manufacturing. Very different background than me. Very different skill set. I find that interesting. And a lot of people in industry do. So those are the three things that I wanted to talk about. Um, and there's actually a little more after this. You may have heard if you can stay. Uh, so we'll take 15 minutes or so of questioning. Uh, and at 12 o'clock, we want to transition to a, a new workshop I've been doing. Uh, it's something called I call Tell Better Stories with the Same Facts. And this, is, uh, this arose from some of the questions that I often get when I give these talks about relaying your experience. So... Somebody coming out of, with a, a PhD, for example, you're used to telling your story in an academic environment, to talking about what you know, what you've done, in a way that would make sense to a, another graduate student or to you know, a professor or somebody at a conference. But do you know how to relay what's important to somebody in industry? Because as we discussed, they're very different jobs. And if you talk too much about the specific tools, you know, hey, I know how to run an electron microscope. Most people you're talking to looking for a job are going to say, hey, that's great. We don't have one. We don't even need one. What can you do for me? And so we're going to go through uh, working with some of your fellow students here on how could you take your experience and start to craft stories that really are meaningful to people you might talk to in the industry. So that will be starting at noon, uh, if you can stick around. But in short... The message that I hope I've conveyed is that industry is a great place for a scientist. It's intellectually challenging, very dynamic, exciting, um, plenty to, to offer, lots of new things to learn, great problem solvers are needed, not at all the plan B that I was certainly led to believe, and I think a lot of people are still unfortunately led to believe. Um, it's way better than that, and I'd like to leave you with a quote from Chris Myatt. So Chris is also in the book. He founded two companies. Precision Photonics made precision optical devices, but now he started in biodiagnostics. Geez, even that's been about 10 years now. A medical company that spun out of that. 
And he says it's about being able to shape the world, and that's very cool. I thought that was a great quote, um, because in industry, you, know, you really see very quickly within 6, 12, 18 months the impact of the work you're doing in a very tangible sense, and it really is about being able to shape the world. Uh, very rewarding opportunities are available. So <coughs> thanks for listening. Uh, go out and turn things, science into things people need. Um, if you're interested, I've got cards up here. Go to my website. I post other thoughts, excerpts from the book, things like that related to careers in industry. And I also brought some of my books. So if you'd like to buy one, it is on Amazon and on iTunes. Uh, there's a Kindle version, but I have some of the paperbacks with me. Uh, they sell for about 12 pounds on on Amazon. I'll sell them for 10 here, plus there's no month lead time. I mean, you get it right away. I don't know why it takes so long to get them across the ocean, but uh, that's what uh, Amazon is quoting at the moment. So I've got a few here if you're interested. I'm Brian Seen. So thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Mr. Oak. Uh, yeah. I think we've got time for a couple of questions from the audience, if anyone would like to ask something. What's the biggest gripe that scientists have in The gripe? Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, you know, so I guess it depends on what jumps to mind when you ask that. Some of them do struggle to make the transition. I talked about you know, how do you have to think differently, and I've known several that struggle to do that. One of the gripes is they don't have the time to really explore a problem in its full detail because they would like to do that, and there can, that can be a part of the challenge sometimes where the manager needs them to finish up and get on and and they want to keep analyzing and keep taking more data and doing that, and that can be a frustration. That might be it. Um, I guess that's probably the big one. Yeah? Um, uh, well, you, you mentioned this sort of like, like going to explore different areas. Mm -hmm. How much uh, room is there in industry for sort of retraining or sort of like learning and, and studying perhaps? <coughs> So I, it's a great question. So uh, it's definitely possible to learn. Now, my experience has been larger companies will actually have courses and things that they will pay for you uh, to do. And generally, you know, education is accepted. Um, you'll find more reluctance to actually take time to do that. You know, in other words, you kind of own getting whatever information you need as quickly as possible. You know, it can be tolerant, but because there's a time frame, Think of it a little more directly. They're focused with, you know, do I wait for you to be trained or do I go find somebody who can do it right away? Um, so, yes, it's fine to learn. In fact, there can be, if, if you think you're a good learner, I know by the time I graduated, I was done with classes. I, I had learned how to learn on my own. <coughs> the Internet's a great tool for that now. You can learn so many things. I prefer to just jump into something new, say, hey, I have a lot to learn, and go figure it out on my own. That's definitely uh, respected. And so I found that I'm able to move around a lot because I'm willing to do that learning on my own and expand. And I find that exciting, and they're willing to... Can I just respond? Yeah. To so, uh, I, I, if you were to take that option, say, for example, you were to sort of do some self-learning, you're studying at home, you're looking at things on YouTube. Yep. And you go to your boss and you say, okay, I don't have a qualification to do it and do this, but you know, I've taught myself <coughs> to do this, I've taught what to do this on the internet. Is that generally sort of... Accepted, Absolutely. Accepted or, or Absolutely. Especially in smaller companies. In fact, I've uh, been places. SDL is a great example. That's where I started. So when I joined them, there were 500 people. By the time JDSU acquired them in 2001, so there were 3,000 people, grown a lot. Uh, everyone I saw there had functioned that way. Whether they moved up into management positions, they didn't have an MBA, they didn't have any business training or finance, anything. They just learned it along the way. And that was totally accepted, and the company grew quite a bit and was very successful with a bunch of smart people just figuring out what was needed to take the company to the next level at whatever they were doing. So absolutely. Uh, there are some bigger companies, the Ball Aerospace where I work, that tends to be more formal. They tend to look more for degrees and things like that. Part of it's because they have the government looking over them, the U.S. government with all these government contracts, and they kind of want certifications and things behind it. I think you might find that in other big companies. Uh, as well, but there is a lot of opportunity that I've seen for self-learning and just, I mean, in, in my current job, you know, it's, it's 
we have a team of people, it's a fairly small company, 30 people, lots of opportunities. Every time something new comes up, management just says, who do we have that can do this? It's not at all about what training do you have, it's almost more about your attributes. That's where attributes really come, you know, is there somebody who's willing to step up, take the risk and say, yeah, I'll try it and figure out how we go along as we, as we make progress? Definitely rewarding. Yeah. So it's a bit related to the first question. You've given a lot of success stories, mm -hmm. um, but what are some of the reasons PhD graduates fail in, uh, in industry? Yeah. I say they've been to your talk and now I try to go to industry and then after a few years they decide, yeah. okay, this is not for me. So, um, specific example, the company I'm at now, we fired a guy back in March because he was, he couldn't get out of that science role and he couldn't get out of just slow improvements, you know, continue to, to, to want to um, keep developing things, keep learning more about it, and not really, I'm not being clear, he couldn't really understand that, you know, this is a project, you have to define what are the specifications, what are the requirements, design something that gets there quickly, test it and verify, yes, it's working, or no, it's not, and I, tr I tried to get through them, we need a test where I, I make a bunch of tests, I enter the numbers, and you know it's in a spreadsheet, and they turn red or green based on whether they failed or passed. Really clear cut. And I always wanted to talk about, well, it's better. Well, it's better. And, and okay, it's even better. I don't know what that means. You know, we've got customers that want specific performance. Give me a test that's red, green. He couldn't get out of that kind of continuous improvement that I identified with this graduate school. You know, you, you keep working on your experiment, it gets better and better, and, and uh, but maybe not crystal clear where you finish. And that's a good example of a, of a non-success. Um, and we struggled to, to get him back where, where you're thinking differently. That's a challenge. So it is important that you train yourself to think and act differently. What kind of jobs in industry um, was someone who, who, who um, uh, were practically in computational physics mm -hmm. find that that would be good for them, as opposed to experimental physics? That's a good question. So obviously, you probably tell I come from an experimental background. Um, so you know, I had a lot of friends uh, who were graduate students who were theoreticians and ended up working for companies like Hewlett Packard um, or uh, one works for now. Well, in Los Alamos, it's a national laboratory uh, in the U.S. doing computational work. Um, especially now, I mean, there's a lot of software. They ended up doing software because to do their modeling, they learned to code and they ended up doing software engineering as a job. That's a pretty common one. Um, uh, data analysis is, you know, so data analysis, part of it, when I talked about it, that's the element of being able to look at it and draw a good conclusion. But there's the mathematical <coughs> part, the computational part of data analysis. I think that can be great if you have computational skills because that's a lot of what's done. And then depending on what you're, you know, there's computational, which is working with numbers, but there is coding in terms of operational software for a system that also might be a good candidate. Editing a software now, I mean, you know, it's, uh, well, it's interesting, uh, my phone is, as an example, you know, if you think of all the different hardware devices that two decades ago were some type of hardware that are now replaced by one product and then software that gets loaded on this, it's amazing, everywhere from, so I, as I was recording uh, the interviews, uh, I was just using my phone. You know, it used to be, it had a little tape player and a little mini cassette, and now it's a phone. I have an inclinometer, uh, a level that I use on there, a calculator. Who carries a calculator anymore? It's all in here, you know. So the point is, a lot of what used to be hardware is now software, and that might be an opportunity for, depending on what you can code in and what you know, it might be something we're thinking about. Is it just computational, or could you code? I can go software. Yeah. So that's a great thing to think about. Yeah, yeah how important is it to find? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How important is it to find the right role straight away, as opposed to getting out there in industry and trying different things? Because I might not know exactly what those job roles you said really applies to me. Yeah, I think I think that's fine to do that. Um, you know, just getting out there and trying and seeing what you can find. I think that's fine. Uh, my goal here more is to help you see what might be jobs you can go after. You know, don't just, look for, especially like if you're a physicist, don't just look for a physicist. You're not going to find much of that in industry. Look for some of these engineer roles and understand they may be different. If you can get into a company, that's a great way to just get in there. 
and see what you can do. And to the point about learning and expanding into other roles, I think that's a great way to do it, especially if you have that broad vision. And uh, yeah. yeah, one last question yeah. from Kira, and then we're going to take a short well, break. It's, it's sort of a question and also a next bit that um, I've realized is because the same thing that you mentioned in your talk about the party having a different perspective yeah. and a different look on PhDs. One of the things I want to bring out is that there are also transition, they, I, I feel there are a lot more transition jobs now. So let's say, for instance, uh, a company like Diamond Light Source or Synchrotron, you, you also have that option where you start to learn that other bits. So, you know, I, I wonder if, you know, a lot of people that you talk to have that experience now because the ORC has a manufacturing branch also. So you could start doing some research and get a little bit of experience management, mm -hmm. you know, and building, even even though they look at researchers also as, as applicants. So, you know, these are transition jobs, but is that something that you've been seeing change in the landscape and a lot of people using these transition jobs? Um, yeah, I, so, uh, certainly some. I mean, I haven't heard about it as much as here. You're talking about something that you can do here in the yeah, in school. I feel, I yeah, I think, I think you guys are ahead of a lot of, I, I have not visited many that have that kind of industry focus. I think it's great. Um, I think it's an excellent model. And, you know, it's probably no surprise, was it the Levin companies, I think, have been spun out of the R ORC? I think that's, that's excellent, but I don't see that kind of vision in a lot of places. Okay, we move on to... Yeah, well, I'd like to thank the speaker again for... Yeah.